And hello, everyone. Welcome to HBS Legal Trends. I'm John Ray, and folks, I'm sitting alongside Jeffrey Dates. Jeff is partner of the Hall Booth Smith Labor and Employment Law Group, the co-chair of that group. Jeff, good to be with you. Nice to be with you as well. Thank you. Yeah, and you've brought along a great guest here. Chris Grosso is with us. Chris, welcome. Welcome to you too. Yeah. Nice to be here. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Let, let's tell everyone about you and your work there at Connor Strong. What are you, what are sure. you, how are you serving folks out there? Yeah. So uh, I've been with Connor Strong for 18 years. Um, Connor Strong is a, is a, a national broker headquartered here in just outside of Philadelphia in Camden, New Jersey. My official title is I'm a partner, a national claim advocacy and consulting leader. So my role uh, at Connor Strong and, and, and the group that I'm a part of is um, is a claims role. It's to advocate and, and act, serve as a consultant for our clients on all claim issues. Obviously, we're going to be talking about employment practices here. Uh, we, we handle everything, but that is a big focus of what we handle and what we get involved with and uh, what we're going to be discussing today. Um, Connor Strong, like I said, is headquartered just outside of Philadelphia. We have offices uh, from Boston down to Florida. And, uh, you know, Jeff and I have been working together the last couple of years, and uh, we look forward to a good discussion. That's terrific. Talk a little bit about the relationship that uh, has developed between Connor Strong and Hall Booth Smith through Jeff. Yeah, so uh, I guess it was back in uh, uh, 2020, the fall of 2020, um, one of our big insurance carrier partners, AIG, uh, a a senior claims uh, person there, uh, introduced me to Jeff. Uh, You know, in the broker world, we obviously like to develop relationships with attorneys because we like to have them appointed to handle our client, our client's claims. And uh, so when I met Jeff and found out that he uh, specialized in employment law, that's obviously, especially over the last several years, been an area of insurance that has blown up for, obvi- for, for a number of reasons that we're going to get into today. And, uh, you know, we just hit it off. They're a national firm. We're a national firm. Um, they have a lot of contacts. We have a lot of uh, uh, connections throughout the industry. And, uh, you know, so... Our partnership is is growing, and we're looking to grow it even further by making introductions both to our customers and carrier partners, and of course, you know, through Jeff's contact. Yeah, I think that when uh, when Chris and I first met, again through a through a carrier, it was actually interesting because in the in a four hour round of golf, we had an opportunity to kind of really connect, and there was a synergy between what I do and what Chris does. So. The individual that actually put us together, I don't think either of us really talked to him for the four-hour <laughs> round. It was pretty much Chris and I talking. But we talked about our background and our experiences and my approach to handling employment work. And I gave him kind of a rundown of what my practice is, that I've been I've been practicing for 28 years. Um, shows why I have all the gray in my beard. But 28 years, and I've only been doing employment litigation defense work. So I talked to Chris about the traditional labor practice that I do. I talked to him about the management council and the device, which is an interesting component for Chris and his clients, and then dovetailed into the employment practice liability insurance, which is the EPL world, which is really what, I guess, let's say the strong suit that Chris and I have this bond against with, I should say, because we both deal with EPLI claims. And the EPLI claims are, it's, it's not trend related, but it's an area of business that is recession proof. Um, it's an it's a growing field. Um, COVID has done a lot to impact EPL world, but employment litigation. I think Chris has always said he's had a fascination with employment law. So during the course of the round, he would ask me various questions like, "What about this? And what about that?" And I had a chance to tell him about the trends and what I see in the employment world, what kind of litigation I've handled, where we're at, and where I think the future of employment litigation is heading. So we bounced ideas back and forth. And we talked about what I try to do, which is servicing and being proactive to protect our clients. And Chris came in with the approach of from a risk management standpoint, which is really how he does the same thing. And then we said, well, look, let's really have a discussion about how we can best work together to give the best bang for the buck, so to speak, to our client insurance. I think that's fair to say. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's terrific. Let's let's dive in a little more deeply into uh, EPL or Employment Practices Liability Insurance and how that how that works and uh, h- how that protects organizations that you work with. So since I've been practicing long enough that there was no EPLI when I first started. So EPLI came about really kind of in the late 90s, but really closer to 2000, 2001. It became a real big standalone product line. Um, through that, we've kind of, we've, the, the employment world's kind of morphed into all employers having to have this insurance. So employment practice liability insurance is, it's been around, it's a growing area. Every company, no matter what size is out there, from a small mom to pop to mid-market, and Chris can talk about what markets he really deals with, but it's an area where it's industry specific. I mean, it's every industry touches upon employment practice liability, whether it's construction, healthcare, pharmaceutical, retail, uh, you name it, pharma, um, power and light. Every industry is affected by the employment practice liability market. For what I do, and Chris works on getting this insurance placed to protect our clients in the event that a claim arises. Yeah, and and you know the the so on the broker world, the way you know there, there's two main aspects of you know what we do uh, in terms of the employment practices space. So we have folks that obviously place the insurance. We we sell the policies. Uh, we go to the market with our uh, to our carrier partners, and we work with all the major insurance carriers to find the best policy, which has the best terms and conditions, has the best rates, and has the best protection. Um, my specific role is when the claims actually start coming in, guiding our insurers on how those claims are going to get handled through the policies that my colleagues have placed. So my role here uh, sort of is a dual role in the sense of obviously I get involved in the claims, and but I also get involved in the renewals because the claims have an impact on how these renewals go, how much our, our clients are going to pay. Um, you know, what size deductibles or retentions they're going to have to take because of the size of the organization they have or the types of claims that they have. So, um, you know, the employment space is, you know, to Jeff's point, you know, over the last four or five years with a lot of the social movements and things that have been happening in the country and, and sort of worldwide, this has been, from a claim standpoint, probably the sec- first or second biggest, you know, area of that we're seeing a, a jump in claims, cyber liability, cyber insurance is, the, is probably the first one. So, you know, I, I point that out because, you know, to Jeff's point, employment practices has been around for 20, 25 years, maybe back in the 90s to early 2000s. Um, but, you know, and, and we've always seen claims, you know, we've, you know, we, 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 but over the last four or five years, you know, in particular, the last two to three years, uh, we've really seen an uptick. And, and a lot of that is driven by, you know, again, the social movements that we're seeing uh, and, you know, sort of the way that society is, is reacting to those things, uh, companies. And, and, you know, our biggest job is to see how the insurance market is responding to these, these movements, because obviously if the insurance carriers project more claims and higher settlements of claims, that's going to impact what insurers are going to pay. And uh, that's some of what we're going to touch on today. Yeah, for sure. So when you talk about the impact of COVID, what you're really talking about is not just uh, the pandemic itself. I mean, you're talking about the remote work environment, right? So, yes, I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that, but also the claims that are going to stem from COVID. So okay. COVID, obviously, the pandemic created, a, you know, yes, the remote work environment, the accommodation issues, the flexibility of work schedules. But where we see it from the employment litigation side is we see a certain area where we think it's going to be a kind of a burgeoning area for EPL COVID claims, which are going to dovetail into we're going to see more uh, disability claims stem from it, more um age discrimination claims, because as the workforce is changing, millennials are coming in, some of the older workforce might be going out. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity where some companies are using that as an opportunity to kind of revamp their personnel, right? So they're retooling and relooking at 
how their companies are going to go in the future. So one thing I do is I kind of identify with Chris and I say, well, from the COVID perspective, this is where we see things happening. And quite frankly, when we talk to different carriers, they say, yeah, we're we're bracing for a storm. We know it's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. It's starting to trickle in. But we think over the next couple of years, it's going to be pretty prevalent in the EPL world. Yeah. And, you know, Jeff and I were talking about this before the show started. You know, right now, we haven't yet seen COVID's impact on the employment practices world from an insurance standpoint. We know it's coming. We assume it's coming. Uh, and, and the EPLI isn't the only line of insurance that's going to be impacted by this. But, you know, to Jeff's point, like, you know, we're in a new environment now with the work from home, you know, the flexibility and stuff like that. And you're seeing, you know, I, I manage a team. So I see, you know, obviously we've had to retool how, how things are, are going and how management styles are done. But from an insurance perspective, the market, we haven't yet seen uh, an influx of claims that are really impacting the market. What we are seeing is carriers are wanting to know how companies are dealing with it. You know, uh, when you place in, when you purchase employment practices insurance, you got to fill out a questionnaire and an application process. And you know, now post COVID, that has become part of the uh, the process. Uh, there's, in fact, I have one in front of me, a coronavirus disease response questionnaire, and this is what some insurance carriers are doing as part of the application for employment insurance is there, there is a COVID-19 uh, section of the questionnaire application process that will impact whether or not an insured, a customer is an attractive risk to, to write for insurance carriers. So from a claim standpoint, we're not seeing yet the volume, we expect we will, but it's already impacting the placement side uh, and, and how insurance carriers are viewing clients as a potential candidate to write their insurance. I think also to your point, um, when you mentioned the application, the applications are being looked at a little bit differently now because we talked before about one of the problems that we see is sometimes insurers are more reluctant to disclose certain things on an application for insurance. And that certainly impacts what you do, impacts what we do, because sometimes claims can be denied if a client insured, let's for instance, misrepresents information of claims or loss run history on an application. But we, we feel that, we see that. Do you see that as well, Chris? Yeah, and I'll give you one example. And I'm just looking at these, you know, when you're talking about like the vaccine requirements, right? Like there's a lot of fluidness to the vaccine. I mean, we've seen it, you know, in our own company, we've, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is so evolving and it was, you know, obviously last year it was a lot more stringent. It looks like uh, companies are, you know, maybe being a little less restrictive with that, but, you know, that's one area where, you know, we think that this could, from a claim standpoint over the next couple of years, and I'm sure you, you might be able to comment on this. We might see more of that because, you know, now we're sort of, you know, hopefully, I don't want to say exiting the, the coronavirus phase, but it's certainly, you know, it's, 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 it's something we're going to have to live with, right? And how companies respond to this and what mandates or requirements that they have in place as it relates to the, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. We're seeing that in questionnaires of these applications for insurance. And, you know, I think what we're going to see, and we haven't yet, is more of an influx of claims if, if employers, you know, have, you know, strict rules surrounding vaccine requirements. And aside from the vaccine requirements, we're also seeing that, you know, because people have been locked into Zoom, right? Everybody's on Zoom. Everybody's, you know, <laughs> we're doing remote access. But where we see claims coming down the pike is also an influx of sexual harassment litigation claims, mm. which is kind of fascinating. Chris and I, I think we've talked about this before because people are very lax. So they feel like they're home, they're in their living room or their dining room or their kitchen, and they're having conversations. But the guard is somewhat down. It feels less formal, formal, right? It feels less formal. It yeah. does. So when it's less formal, there's a little bit more liberties that people take amongst conversations with people in the workplace. And I think that is going to be problematic. And a lot of states have a two-year statute of limitations. So there's a two-year window out there for claims to arise. That's a great point because there was, uh, just like there was no training on going doing remote work for so many companies, they weren't planning on this. Uh, the the employment uh, uh, standards and how you conduct yourself and what have you 
in a remote work environment. There just wasn't that training and uh, for employees out there, right? That's true. And you saw you, there were a couple of lawsuits, sexual harassment lawsuits that came about that were filed simply because of even the way people may have been dressed for a Zoom call, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that hit the press. It was, it was kind of a widespread yeah. widespread case. Um, and I think that's that's an issue out there. But I think the, you know, the accommodation and flexibility is important, but understanding that, you know, you're still a professional, you still hold or held to certain standards of conduct. I think we're going to see claims arise from that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about Comprehensive Employment Practices Audits. This is another area in which the two of you collaborate. Yeah, so on the audit side, I'll tell you this. Um, there's a lot of people out there. We, we've talked to clients in the past and, and prospects, and we've talked about whether their company has ever had an employment practice audit. And uh, I, I'd say that probably uh, nine out of ten times, most companies will say that they have not had an audit. And I'll ask them, do you, do you know what an audit is? And they'll say no. And I explain what an audit is. And an audit is essentially a service that we do. And I've been doing this for years for clients. And it's basically a, a comprehensive opportunity for us to go in, look at your hire package, your applications for employment, your personnel policies, your leave request forms, your uh, personnel evaluations, um, your offer letters, your exit interviews, uh, you name it. So it runs the gamut. For everything, whether you have interview questionnaires, canned questions that you use for an interview. And I, what I do is I go and I review all that and I give reports and recommendations, suggestions to help obviously make people compliant because a lot of people invariably ask questions that they shouldn't ask. But the idea behind the audit is I work the tools to help somebody like Chris. So if I do an audit, I've cleaned up their, pro- their policies. I have now made them compliant across the board on EEO laws, right? Employment equal opportunity laws. So I give that, I kind of hand that over to somebody like Chris and Chris can use those tools. Yeah. So lot, so that's where I'll pick this up. So, you know, as a broker, you know, one of our, obviously a, a chief role of a broker is to shop for the best, the best policy, the best pricing, the best, you know, program, the best insurance program. And we work with, you know, so many, many different insurance companies throughout the country and the world, really. So part of that process is making the prospective carriers, the market, uh, look favorably upon our customers, right? So by you know looking at the employment space in particular, if we have an opportunity where we're shopping the market for a client for employment practices insurance, and they've had one of these audits, and we can say to the prospective markets that, you know, a law firm, Hall Booth Smith, came in, did a full comprehensive audit, and to Jeff's point, cleaned up areas in that space that needed to be cleaned up. They now look like a much more attractive risk. Um, you know, part of my job on the claim side, you know, at when, in, when our clients' insurance is coming up for renewal, you know, what do carriers want to know about? Prospective carriers, they want to know about claims. They also want to know about what protocols are in place to prevent claims. And these employment practices audits, you know, and anything, any sort of service like that, you know, and obviously we're talking about employment practices here, mm-hmm. uh, can be very beneficial. Because like I said, we can say to the prospective markets that they did a, a comprehensive sort of look under the hood and buttoned up any areas uh, where, you know, where we feel claims could come in and they automatically look like a much more attractive risk. And, you know, you can get better terms, get better conditions, get better pricing. You know, insurance carriers, you know, look, they want to make money, right? Uh, and obviously, if they are, you know, they're going to charge based on, you know, the exposures that, the, you know, that, that that particular client has. And, you know, they're going to project losses, And naturally, some of that in the employment space is going to be based off of, you know, what kind of internal protocols you have to prevent claims, to avoid claims from happening altogether. So when with this audit, it's a it's a very good and attractive way for us to be able to say this is an attractive risk. They've done this audit. They've they've fixed areas that they need fixing, uh, which could prevent future claims. And as it relates even one step further, which is so we've talked about from the standpoint of what we as lawyers can do in terms of offering an employment practice audit and how 
we can provide those tools to Chris and to folks at Connor Strong and how they can utilize that to the carrier side. But the other side is as well, who benefits from this? It's the client insurance. So not only are we providing this service on that front, we're also coming in there and Chris is able to then use this as a tool to help educate his clients and the do's and don'ts, the pitfalls and practices and protocols that they may or may not be following. So it gives us an opportunity to kind of get in there and constructively work to kind of rebuild their policies, give them solid programs. So it it endures to the benefit of the insurance side, but also in-house on a day-to-day basis. If we can get in there and help them with the tools, tell them how to do things appropriately or, or fix what is broken, right? Or if there's a crack, fix it before it becomes a full crack. If we can do stuff like that, that is for the betterment of the insured. And the betterment of the insured makes a happy insured. Happy workplace reduces claims. Claim reduction is what? Bottom line. I mean, yeah, it obviously impacts the bottom line. And then just the one final point to that is, you know, I would say, you know, obviously these employment practice audits, and Jeff and I have talked about this, the intention is to fix, you know, areas of, of, of concern so that claims don't come in and, and you don't have claims. But you still may have claims, obviously. But with those processes and protocols in place, it helps you better defend the claim when it comes in. You know, it's, it's much easier to sit in front of a mediator or a judge and say, you've done all these things. You've done all the, all the, all the, you've checked every box. You've done everything right. And even though the claims still come in, we've got great defenses to it. And that's proven through, you know, dedication to, you know, following the procedures and recommendations from these audits. So it's, it's not just from, you know, a, a renewal, you know, pricing, like this is an attractive risk perspective, but when the claim does come in, it, it really provides us a leg up on uh, defending that claim successful. Yeah. You, know, you know, two things I'm hearing here that are, are really attractive. I mean, one is just the, the value of having by definition, an audit is conducted by an independent third party. So you've got an, in, an independent third party view of what's going on with, with that organization. And then Chris, you, you made a strong point about, it sounds like there's a tangible ROI uh, to uh, to going through the expense of this audit because there's there's obviously an expense, but you're getting a tangible ROI in terms of reduced premiums and better uh, terms and conditions. Absolutely, and and like I said, better defensive claims when they do come in. There you go, there you go. So let's talk a little bit about um, I guess the further value that the two of you see in the, in the work you do together on behalf of, of your organizations. You go first. All right. Well, so, you know, like I said, you know, our job as a broker is to manage our clients risk. It's not just, you know, again, at the placement side. And now I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what I sort of do day to day on the claims end. And, you know, when we, you know, when we partner with a, with a client and, and Connor Strong, at Connor Strong, we, you know, our, most of our customers are, you know, m- you know, middle market to larger type, you know, businesses, you know, publicly held private, you know, large private businesses or, or publicly held companies. So, you know, we don't, not so much in the small business space, so I can really only speak to larger business space, but, you know, most of the policies in the employment practices field that we place come with high deductibles or retentions, right? So what does that mean? That means the insured's got to pay a, a good portion of the claim. You know, uh, this is a space, this is an area where, you know, it's not, you pay the premium and the insurance company pays the losses. You know, most of our clients have large deductibles and retentions. And what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, they want to have a, a major say in how the claim is handled. And part of that is selecting the right business partners, law firms and whatnot, to help manage those claims when they come in. And that's one of the things we do here that we find is very beneficial to managing our customers' risk is lining up those relationships. When you have a relationship with your law firm, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time a claim comes in. You have a, you've had that partnership, you, you know, they know what that client's all about. They understand it, it cuts down on the amount of time you have to spend, you know, billable hours. I don't want to take money out of Jeff's pocket, but you know, the reality is, is that, you know, when you establish those relationships up front and you set the protocols up front, when the claims do start coming in, it's a much more well-oiled machine. So partnering like that with a law firm like Hall Booth Smith, 
uh, in the employment space. I mean, obviously, you know, this is an area that I've become very passionate about, the employment practices space. When Jeff and I met and I, I saw his expertise and, you know, that first day when we met, that's, you know, aside from the fact that we hit it off personally, I was very, very, very much intrigued by his knowledge in that space. And, you know, obviously we have we have people that are very knowledgeable here. Um, but, you know, he brought a different perspective. And, you know, so the benefit to us is to be able to make those introductions to our customers and say, like, look, you know, we we have a great firm, a great partner that we work with that, you know, we think would be a great benefit to helping you defend and, 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 and litigate these claims when they come in. And it's, 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 you know, it, it's a great, it's a great thing to do, you know, and uh, it really makes the process go a lot smoother for the customer. Look, reality is these are, you know, these are difficult situations. They're very, very sensitive claims. Uh, insureds get very, you know, it, it's, these are highly sensitive topics. And, you know, our customers, our insurers have to trust us as the broker, Jeff as the, as the legal, as, as the attorney, and of course, our insurance carrier partners that we're going to get the best outcome. And when you set up that partnership ahead of time, it makes it go a lot smoother. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about the conditions, market conditions sure. and, and renewal considerations that organizations ought to have given what the two of you see? Yeah. So obviously I'll take that one. And, and, you know, it, it, for those in the insurance industry know that, you know, the, the industry has been in what we call a hard market for the last several years. Uh, capacity has shrunk, rates are going up, insurance are paying more money uh, for policies. And obviously that's having a much greater impact on their bottom line. Uh, and, and that's happening in a hard market. That happens even with clients that don't have bad claim experience. And if you have bad claim experience, it's that much more worse. It's that much worse. Now, specific to employment practices, um, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, the, the, we're sort of, as an industry, sort of coming out of a hard market and employment is sort of following that trend. Uh, I use cyber as an analogy because like the cyber world is anything but that. That is, that is a world that is blowing up. Uh, and I, you know, and Look, everybody watches the news, right? You see the cyber attacks going on throughout the country and the world. It's not surprising that insurance carriers who for years weren't charging enough or weren't, you know, didn't have more restrictive uh, terms and conditions in their policies. They were just paying claims constantly. And of course, that has a result, uh, an impact on what, what they charge in rates. Kind of thought you might see more of that in employment because over the last three years and three, you know, several years, We've seen, you know, this groundswell of social movements and things. And then on top of that, COVID. But the employment practices market hasn't really been impacted like cyber, for instance, because those are the two areas that we've seen a really influx in claims. It's really kind of stayed consistent with the rest of the market hard. And then it's softening a little bit. Insurance carriers, you know, there's, there's still plenty of capacity, meaning that there's plenty of insurance carriers that are willing to write employment practices. You know, where we see the work, you know, the, the two areas that we're seeing that are really affecting pricing is certain industries like healthcare, public entity, and, and others. Those are those are two areas where um, you know, and residential real estate is another one where you know they're really they're getting hit harder than maybe the rest of the market. Um, and then two other things is retentions and deductibles are going up. You know, we're seeing insurance carriers and they might keep pricing stable, but what they're asking of the insureds is to take a higher deductible or retention, take more skin in the game. Um, and then those clients that are having bad claim experience and a bad, bad claims history that are having a lot of claims are clearly being hit hard. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty much in terms of rate increases. It's consistent with what the rest of the market is doing in other lines of business, except, again, like I said, for some, which, you know, you can have anywhere from 5 to 25 percent of what we're seeing. Of course, on the high end, those are the, the clients that are experiencing more, more claims, more loss uh, activity. But, you know, you know, capacity hasn't really changed. And again, I pointed some of that out and I'm talking to some of my colleagues here who are, whose job it is to study the market. Again, I think there was a, a belief that with all of what's going on in the country and, and the world the last couple of years, that it might hit 
that market a little bit harder again, like you're seeing in cyber, but it wasn't as much as dramatic yet as we've seen. Now that could change. I mean, we just talked about COVID earlier and how, you know, COVID is, you know, we're still waiting to see that, that, you know, that, that influx of claims that could change. So we'll have to see how that, how that plays out over the next you know couple of years. Sure. That makes sense. Now we talked about market conditions, but then there's the application process itself so talk about how that's changed, uh, what uh, folks need to be looking at there and factors that they need to consider. Yeah, so so let's, as, you, as you address that, let's incorporate the definition of a claim. Yeah, because that yeah. Is, I think the two of them are hand in hand. Yeah, so let's talk about the application process first, and then I will talk. So, you know, you know employment, again, the, what we see, especially in the employment space, I think, and what you're seeing is there is greater increased attention in terms of of underwriting, right? So most insurance companies are becoming more diligent about really underwriting the risk. What processes and protocols do you have in place? You know, and a lot of that starts with human resources and other departments within. So, so, you know, with, with the influx of claims over the years through, you know, societal changes like the like the social movements i think you know insurance carriers are getting you know their their underwriting is getting a little more tight you know they're looking at how companies are are dealing with you know these issues these employment issues like i said through through the application process you know a lot of things like major shifts in employee counts is something that they're they're paying close attention to you know if if you're doing massive layoffs you know obviously with covid that's part of what, you know, we expected to see and still may see. Um, so as part of the application process, you know, these are the types of things that I think are really sort of driving the, you know, what the insurance companies are looking for in terms of a good risk, you know, a client that they really want to, you know, that, that they want to write. But, you know, there hasn't been any major changes in the application process. Like I said, I think more of it is, a greater focus on how how insureds and how customers are are dealing with this stuff internally. And again, employee counts. Are you seeing dramatic shifts in employee counts? You know, um, are you know were they doing massive layoffs? That kind of stuff. And that's you know whereas before, like in a soft market, like insurance companies just want to write, right? They just want to get business on the books. And maybe they're not paying as much attention to the to they're not underwriting as as aggressively. Well, in the employment space, they are because again, I mean, they expect just like the rest of us that claim activity is on the rise. They see it for the reasons we've been discussing over the last half hour, and uh, that's causing them to be a little more uh, aggressive in terms of their underwriting app, uh, protocols. Uh, in terms of like you know what is a claim, you know that 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 is something that we do, we spend a lot of time educating our customers on because one of the biggest misconceptions or or areas of of concern that we see with, with clients is what is a claim, you know, under an employment practices policy, if somebody makes a complaint to their manager, is that a claim? Well, I guess, and that's where you really have to understand what the policy actually pays for. What does it cover? What does it not cover? The two big things that we look at and then we educate clients on so that they understand you know, what to report to us and what not to report to us is how does the policy define claim and how does the policy define wrongful act? So those two things in tandem are very important. And we we spent a lot of time educating our clients on that because these policies, these employment practices policies have very strict provisions as it relates to notice. So if you don't timely notice the insurance company when you get a quote unquote claim, you could jeopardize coverage for that claim, even though you have an active policy. So that is part and parcel to what we do in terms of education, you know, not just what we talked about with the application process and and, and partnering with with Hall Booth and and, and Smith on, on, you know, employment audits, but it's also about, okay, now you have the policy, understand how to use it. And, one of the biggest ways to do that is to understand some key definitions, because again, 
They're not insurance professionals. Some of them have, you know, some a lot, plenty of our clients have, you know, folks that understand insurance, but it's our job to understand it day to day and understand how these policies work when the claims actually do come in. And in this particular space, that is one area that we spend a lot of time educating our customers on because we want to make sure that they know when do they have a claim and what they need to do with it. And sometimes understanding what a claim is as defined by the policy can be subjective. It can be unclear. And that's why we spend a lot of time educating our customers on that so that they don't jeopardize the coverage that they paid a lot of money for. And when we go in and do internal audits, part of what we do is we will do uh, management training for senior management, HR, CFOs, CEOs, um, the decision makers. And then sometimes we'll offer, because some states require it, uh, rank and file. We'll call them rank and file, non-supervisors, non-managerial employees, and we train them as well. But when we do the training seminars for the managers, a component of what we do is we talk about that very issue, which is we talk about what is a claim. Because I want them to understand. I want managers to understand. Because sometimes a lower tier manager might receive a complaint, not know what to do with it. By the time it's reported up the chain of command, it might already be too late. So I spent some time identifying that issue for clients, which is for the managers, which is what is what it is a claim and what you do. And I always tell them, Frontline issue, when you get a claim, you make the phone call. So I'd rather you get on the phone, call Chris, say, hey, I have a potential claim. Okay? So that Chris can deal with it be- because, look, people are not shy to reject a claim or deny coverage, right? Insurance carriers, yeah. So if they can decline coverage, they can decline coverage. But we're our job is to make sure that we're obviously making sure that we're servicing the insurers and the clients. They have the insurance. They have it for a reason. Yeah, and I'll just just to end on this point. I mean, if you look at like I, I have a, a a client's policy up right now, and you know the definition of claim that there's there's usually you know six or seven or more you know uh, defined you know um, items under the definition of a claim. The first one reads a written demand for monetary damages or non monetary relief. Very broad. So, you know, what does that mean? An email? Like, I mean, it can mean a lot of things. And clients sometimes don't understand that they may get something that is defined as a claim under the policy, but if they don't act, needs to be calling us as their broker and say, hey, we think we have something here. And this thing blows up six months, eight months, a year from now, that could be a real problem for them triggering coverage under the policy because of the strict notice provisions. And if we hear something, we immediately tell the client, tender the claim to yeah, the broker, broker, let the broker get that claim to file the immediately, right? That's proactive and preventative. Wow. Uh, some terrific advice here, folks, from uh, Chris Grasso with Connor Strong. Uh, this has been great information and, and timely and helpful. And uh, Chris, I can't imagine that there are some folks that would like to uh, – know more about you and your work. So let's give them directions on how to find you. All right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions, uh, obviously I, uh, I can, my, uh, my direct phone number, I'll give you my, my, uh, my, my direct office line and then I'll give my email address. My, my direct office line is 856-479-2145. Uh, my email address is C Grosso. That's C G R O S S O at connorstrong.com. I'll spell Connor Strong C O N N E R S T R O N G.com. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if anybody has any questions or ideas or want to bounce some things off of us, uh, myself, uh, happy to help. That's terrific. Chris Grosso with Connor Strong. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And folks, just a quick reminder that this show is brought to you by Hall Booth Smith. It's no secret, I think you've heard this today, that labor and employment laws are becoming more nuanced and complex. And that's why the Labor and Employment Practice Group at Hall Booth Smith is the first choice for companies, educational institutions, and municipalities around the country seeking the strategic guidance necessary to safeguard against potential claims and resolve conflicts in the most favorable and cost-effective way. For more information, go to hallboothsmith.com. And if you want to get directly to the co-chair of the Labor and Employment Law Group, Jeff Dates is your man. And Jeff, let's get every, give everyone your contact information as well. 
Same thing. Everybody can reach me at J D A I T Z at Hall Boothsmith.com. Jeff, this has been great. Thank you so much for uh, getting Chris and the two of you coming on the show. Thank you very much for having both of us. Thank you. Absolutely. Folks, again, this is John Ray. Thanks so much for joining us here on HBS Legal Trends. Mm-hmm.